Okay, again, as I just mentioned, this is Courtney Britton with the Texas Wildlife Association, and today's Wildlife for Lunch webinar is Prescribed Burning for Wildlife by Dr. Dale Rollins. Dr. Rollins, I'm going to pass it over to you, and you can take us from here. Okay, thank you, Courtney, and uh, welcome to all of y'all that are online to uh, become better students of prescribed burning. It is my pleasure to be with you here today, and I appreciate this technology. And the fact that I didn't have to drive anywhere to give it, you didn't have to drive anywhere to listen. So uh, we're money ahead today. Our topic, uh, as Courtney said, is fire as a tool for managing wildlife habitat in Texas. I want to start off to get some idea of, of who our audience uh, includes. So uh, Courtney, if you will, poll them on this question just to see who's got some experience in conducting prescribed burns. Courtney, are you there? Our poll is open and we've got, here are our responses. We've got a couple of folks who are putting their response in as we speak. Okay. So there we have our answer. Okay, so uh, almost half of you have conducted a prescribed burn. That's good. Uh, for the other half, or roughly one-third that has not, again, we appreciate your interest in it. And the reason that I ask that is, uh, as, as you'll see as we go through today's session, it's really not a how-to burn, but just more of a background on uh, how burning can impact wildlife and wildlife habitat. Uh, Courtney, can we poll that second question? Is there anybody that is a certified prescribed burn manager? If so, please indicate now. The certified prescribed burn manager is a level of expertise that allows you to burn even if your county is in under a uh, burn ban. So that's something perhaps that you would wish to ascribe to and continuing education is a big part of that. A couple more seconds here for folks to finish their answers. And for more information about the Certified Prescribed Burn Manager Program, uh, which most of you are not, it uh, looks like a few of you are Certified Prescribed Burn Managers. If you're not and you want to learn more about that, uh, you can uh, go to the Texas Department of Agriculture's website or some other websites that I present at the end of today's session and learn more about that. You have to have education, you have to have uh, uh, quite a bit of experience, and then you have to uh, undergo a, a prescribed burn certification course. Okay, as I just mentioned, today we're going to talk more about the when, why, and where, but not how. In other words, I don't want to equip you, get you all motivated to do a prescribed burn, you walk away from this lunchtime seminar thinking, well, I learned how to burn today from Rollins and go out there and uh, we might have a wreck on our hands. So just realize that uh, you need to seek appropriate training and assistance, and I'll give you some websites and some other areas where you can do that towards the end of, end of today's presentation. I'm a native of Oklahoma, and a former governor, George Nye, used to quote, make this quote quite often, we study the past and apply it to the present that we may affect the future. And I think that's an excellent quote for the for our topic du jour on prescribed burning. So we're going to break today's uh, webinar into three parts. Part one will be kind of a history of fire as a tool. Uh, second part will be fire ecology as it relates especially to deer and quail management in Texas. And then part three that we'll wind up with is some uh, assistance for you to continue your education in becoming a pyro manager. If we could turn back the clock a couple hundred years, uh, right outside of San Angelo, we might have seen this situation today. Uh, perhaps these Comanche Indians would be uh, conducting a prescribed burn. Uh, this picture, just this painting just illustrates the fact, again, that fire as a tool has a long history on the North American continent, and especially in the Great Plains. Uh, most of Texas uh, probably burned on an interval anywhere from three to seven years historically for the last, who knows, 30,000 years or so. 
So a fire as a tool to our plants and our animals is really not new. And we changed that fire landscape about 100 years ago, and we're beginning to really have second thoughts about that over the last 20 years, and so hence uh, our interest in fire as a tool today. If we look at uh, the impacts of fire on wildlife historically, again, uh, if, we, if we could turn back the clock or even just turn it back to last year, if we still had bison across West Texas, we might have seen this because we had a tremendous wildfire season in 2011 because of uh, fuel buildups the previous year and then uh, La Nina weather conditions. And again, you can appreciate that that's not just a recent si uh, situation. We've had those for thousands of years. And so we've had that type of fire season unimpeded for many, many years, uh, and that made a tremendous impact on the types of vegetation and the types of wildlife we had. But as Mark Twain said, the difference between the right word and almost the right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug, and this is an important distinction. Uh, many people are still extremely excitable about the use of fire as a tool on our rangelands, and that's because their experience probably stems from a wildfire and not a prescribed burn. So you got to appreciate uh, the tension that uh, exists in many of our uh, government officials and many of our neighbors and so forth. And, and that really puts the onus on us to be good students of, of prescribed burning and, and that we handle our business in a professional and competent manner. As a result of those wildfires over the last hundred years, um, many of us, uh, many parts of society kind of subscribe to what we in the business called the smoke through the bear syndrome, which basically said all fires are bad. And over the last 30 years, we've really begun to question that. And we realize again that fire can be a beneficial tool. And as a result of those types of uh, research, education, uh, we've changed our thoughts and our attitudes about burning. I use this slide uh, to indicate very quickly or relate a story that happened to me back in the uh, 1990, I'm sorry, 1985, I was a range management specialist for Oklahoma State University at the time, and we were doing a prescribed burn just off the east side of the Wichita Mountains Wildlife Refuge, and the Wichita Mountains has a, a very large uh, uh, bison population, and as we began to burn with the southwest wind, that smoke blew across the refuge, and I thought it was extremely cool that as that smoke column went low across the refuge, the bison uh, appeared on that landscape and began to move in the direction of that smoke column. Uh, just a, an interesting phenomena that occurred that day. As Aldo Leopold, who we recognize as the father of wildlife management in, in North America, once said, the urge to comprehend must precede the urge to reform. So again, as students of, uh, of prescribed burning and of wildlife habitat management, we have to learn about how fire can be used, how it can be misused, and be able to make that distinction as we move forward. And our goal as students of uh, quail or deer or plant ecology should become, should to become a pyromanager and not be viewed as a pyromaniac. And I hope that you can appreciate the differences between those two terms. Back in 2005, uh, Texas AgriLife Extension in conjunction with Texas Wildlife Association and some other partners presented a symposium in Kerrville, I suspect some of you were there, called The Role of Fire as a Tool in, in uh, Habitat Management in Texas. And those proceedings are available at that website. You can uh, download those as a PDF or you can order those from AgriLife Bookstore if you have an interest. It covers everything from uh, burning for uh, endangered species to plant ecology in each of the 10 equal regions of Texas, so it's much more in-depth treatise than what I will be talking about today. Again, over the last 40 years or so, there's been a lot of effort to learn and educate the public about positive influences of fire. Uh, places like Tall Timbers Research Station in Florida had a big part of that. Uh, Herb Stoddard, who's a pioneer in quail back in the 20s, I talked about burning for Bob White Management in the Southeast. And a lot of information generated by our various universities and agencies. In Texas, we could point to folks like uh, Dr. Henry Wright at Texas Tech, who kind of led the effort in Texas, uh, Dr. Charlie Cypress at Texas A&M, and other pioneers that helped us uh, shape that image about prescribed burning in Texas. I had a professor um, at, as a college student at Oklahoma State 
University back in about 1980, and he made this quote. He was referring to the demise of the mule deer herd across the Rocky Mountains, and he said all it needs is a hot fire and a windy day. Now, he might have been a bit cavalier, but what he was saying was that as we took fire out of that management equation for 75 years, that vegetation, that landscape changed, and those landscape changes were not necessarily friendly to many species, and in this case, uh, elk and mule deer. And so we know, again, that fire did have a historical role in those, and trying to capture that and be able to apply it in today's context is a, is a very powerful tool. I'll talk a little bit more about some resources that you can uh, download and learn more about and the way you can become a better student of prescribed burning. I want to move now, though, into part two, which we'll spend most of our time on, and that is fire ecology. And when I say fire ecology, just the impacts, the interactions between fire, between the landscapes, between the plant communities, uh, and between some of the wildlife communities. I'm not going to really talk about fire as a tool for ranch management in the context of livestock management, but uh, you should appreciate that uh, burning is a tool that pays uh, multiple dividends simultaneously. So if you're interested in putting steer gain on your livestock, well, a prescribed burn at the right time can be a very uh, useful tool. But talking about fire, and I'm talking primarily about uh, ecosystems in the southern Great Plains, uh, really anywhere west of the Piney Woods in Texas, you would be in a pretty much a, a fire-shaped uh, plant community. So uh, again, historically, a fire as a tool swept across most of those areas, perhaps on a scale or a frequency from uh, every three to seven years. Again, Leopold pointed out that the central thesis of game management is this. Game can be restored by the creative use of the same tools which have heretofore destroyed it. Axe, plow, cow, fire, and gun. And we're going to focus in again on prescribed burning for this session. My preacher often says that you're free to choose your actions, but you're not free to choose the consequences. And we've seen many of these consequences face to face when we took fire out of the system, took fire out of our toolbox for a hundred years. And so the the popularity, the, the abundance in many areas of Texas of some of the fire susceptible species like junipers especially, and I know all of you have seen an encroachment or increase, whether that be ash juniper, red bear juniper, or in this case, eastern red cedar. And fire in, uh, in the one sense is the original Agent Orange, you have to help keep the uh, prairie free of those types of species. Now, in the same breath, let me say that fire, in general, kills very few plants. The cedars are an exception to that, but our blue stems, most of our woody plants are fire adapted. They restrap quite vigorously after a fire. So learning more about fire ecology and learning more about how fire can be used as a tool is our goal today. I often cite this as what I call Rollins Rules of Range Management. I was a range management professional at Oklahoma State before coming to Texas in 1987 as a wildlife specialist. But the, the basic rules of plant ecology remain the same, whether you're managing for white-faced steers or white-tailed deer, black baldy cows, or bob-white quail. And those two bottom line principles are these. Know your plants and know how to manipulate them. So know which plants are important. If I'm managing for Bob Whites, I want my, my landscape to look like this. If I'm managing for uh, golden chief warblers or black cat vireos, I want it to look like this. Sometimes those landscapes will overlap, other times they'll be distinct. And so once I know kind of what my landscape should look like, then what types of tools, would it be a, a excavator here, would I be using some type of heavy equipment, uh, grazing management, prescribed fire, what are the tools that are necessary to promote that suite of plants, because if I can promote that suite of plants, then I can probably increase usable space for my particular species or wildlife communities of interest. I apologize for the phone. I told them not to forward calls, but they did anyway, so bear with me. Okay, some of the factors that affect the vegetation response, and you got to appreciate that uh, there are many factors that do affect that vegetation, but the season of the burn, these are some of the ones that are under, some of these are under our control, others are not. Season of the burn, the scale of the burn, the intensity of the burn, the post-burn management, 
That means primarily the grazing management because that has a big effect on our vegetation response about how it is, uh, burn, how it's grazed in that post burn sequence. And then the post burn weather. You can appreciate that if we'd have burned a year ago heading into that historic drought, we would have made a mistake. So uh, one rule of thumb you want to think about is never burn unless you have soil moisture in the bank. If you're drying, if you're burning with a dry soil, you have a risk of it continued dry. So always have good soil moisture when you burn, and then you'll have a, generally a favorable plant response. The vegetation response, again, will change depending on such things as soil type. Uh, all those factors are listed while ago. This is Chip Ruthman. Many of you know Chip with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. This is when he was at the Chaparral Wildlife Management Area. And you can see from this slide, this was burned like in February of the year. This was this photo was taken in October. And you can see a very luxuriant plant growth. That was probably a, a good El Nino type uh, weather year. So the vegetation became quite luxuriant. Again, if you had burned a year ago going into that horrendous La Nina, you would not have seen that type of vegetation response. The season of the burn can be manipulated to foster certain plant communities. Generally, when you burn in February, March, April, you're favoring warm season grasses over forbs. When you burn in uh, September, October, you're generally favoring forbs and cool season grasses, things like Texas winter grass, over those warm season grasses. So by manipulating the date of that burn, you can have some sometimes pretty tremendous plant responses. This photo was taken up in the uh, tall grass prairie area of uh, central Oklahoma. And again, the date of the burn uh, on the left here was burned in early September, in the right it was burned in late March. You can see how we favored a grass community over here. We favored a forb community, in this case broomweed, over here. Now you might say, well, who in the world would try to promote that kind of plant community? As a quail manager, that looks better to me than this. But as a beef manager, you can appreciate they probably like this better. So again, know your plants, know how to manipulate them. There are some other things here that, uh, again, we can tweak a little bit and sometimes get a tremendously different plant response. But uh, yes, uh, Courtney has a, a polling question up there, so I would like your input. Does fire advance or retard succession? Does it set plant succession forward or backwards? Give me your thoughts on that. And I am not against asking trick questions. Okay, Courtney, if you can show us the results, audience says. I'm willing to venture a bet that 98% uh, of you said it retards or sets back plant succession. Let's see if my faith is rewarded. Well, I'm a bit surprised. Uh, a third of you studied advanced plant succession, and I would argue that the correct answer, being a Texas Tech Red, Red Raider, is it depends. If I burn most of the situations in Texas, I will be setting plant succession back. I'll be retarding it. And that's generally our goal. But if I burn, and again, in uh, mid spring, when that uh, little blue stem has about an inch of green growth on it, and then if I don't graze it thereafter, I will advance plant succession in those uh, prairie sites. So again, the answer is it depends, and those are some of the factors that it might depend on. The, the take home message just being there again, depending on what your goal is, sometimes you can tweak such factors as these and invoke a different plant response. One of the things that we often like to do in uh, wildlife management, and this is a little bit different sometimes than managing rangelands for livestock production, Sometimes in wildlife management, in fact, I would argue many times, we want to promote a diverse plant community. We want a patchy landscape. Whereas if I'm managing for stock or steers, I might want that entire 1,000 acres to be grazed uniformly. For Bob White Quail, that's not my goal. I want uneven grazing distribution. I want a patchy community. And fire has a very interesting and uh, opportunistic role to play in that type of management. This photo shows the lock, shows a pasture on the Lockapeda Experimental Range down near Alice, Texas, um, courtesy of Wayne Hansaka. And what we did here, this was back when we were promoting the concept of brush sculpting. 
So we went in with GPS and we were able to put in the outline of the state of Texas where we wanted to be able to show up well, so then we subsequently burned that area to get this Texas picture burned into that Texas landscape. Now here's my question to you. If I was to turn a hundred cow-calf pairs in there and we could fast forward this picture 60 days, let's say, where would those cattle be spending the bulk of their time grazing? Would they be out here, here, or would you tend to see some focus here? And we don't have that set up as a polling question, but I can assure you that probably 80% of the use of that pasture is now focused on that burn country. The livestock especially and other wild herbivores are really attracted to fresh burns. And so we can use that knowledge to put in smaller burn plots into larger pastures and create this patch disturbance regime, which has become quite topical over the last 10 years uh, as a habitat management tool. This is that same philosophy at the Rolling Plains Crow Research Ranch up in Fisher County. We have a tremendous prickly pear, low prickly pear problem, which as a quail manager, uh, I have mixed thoughts about. My bird dogs don't like it, but quail like to nest in prickly pear. And I'm trying to develop a quail friendly approach to prickly pear management. And patch burn grazing is one of the tools that we use. We know that if we burn that, that these cattle will be attracted over that. They'll eat some of that, uh, eat some of that burn prickly pear to provide some biological control. And then as a result of that close grazing here, we're going to promote different plants here. We're going to be growing ragweed, broomweed, sunflowers. And so we can use that combination of burning and grazing as a useful tandem, a useful one-two to create the types of plant communities that we want. This just shows a cow equipped with a GPS collar. We can monitor those cows on that landscape. Every 30 minutes we get a fix on where those cattle are grazing. And again, this just shows one of the pastures, many different polygons that we manage on. We'll burn some of those at different times and then be able to track where the cattle go and what the plants, how the plants respond to that. Uh, if you're ever up in the Sweetwater vicinity, I hope you'll come by and see us at the Rolling Plains Crow Research Ranch. We'll be glad to show you uh, some of those pastures. Okay, switching gears just a little bit, let's talk about the animal response to fires during two periods, the, the actual burn itself and then the post-burn. Now, if you've got good eyes, you might see that there's a coyote, a, a thoroughly singed coyote in that pasture, and so this would make you think that uh, wildlife mortality is a big consideration when conducting a prescribed burn. And really it's not. We tend to get our preconceived notion about animal response, wildlife response to fires based upon our uh, movies that we watched as a kid, for example, Bambi, and how the critters flee from that. But in most prescribed burn situations, you don't see any type of hysteria among the uh, wild critters. Again, uh, they they move to one side of the fire, they find a hole in the firewall in the uh, flame front and move through that. But it's nothing like that. The only reason this uh, coyote got burned in this situation, this was a heavy broomweed year. And when you have a very dense broomweed year, you can have some mortality. You can observe some fire-induced mortality on some critters, things like armadillos and so forth. But generally, the uh, mortality of wildlife during a fire itself is, is minimal. Now, during the post-burn, it can be positive or negative, and we'll discuss some of those uh, situations as we move through. Let's look first at the, uh, at the white-tailed deer. Now, if I'm a deer manager, fire is going to be one of my most favored tools, and I'm going to want to use it quite often. Uh, burning does a lot of things for the deer manager. It uh, really improves the accessibility, the quality, and the quantity of our browse species. Again, keep in mind that very few species of woody plants are actually killed by fire. Uh, in this case, it's in Kerr County, and we were trying to, uh, this was an area that had been chained previously, and we were burning to, uh, to control the regrowth juniper that's coming in to burn off the slash piles. So we were killing some cedar trees that were perhaps five feet uh, tall and lower, but once those, five, once those cedar trees get above about head high, it takes a really horrendous fire uh, to give you much control. And so we're really just trying to control those, uh, those re sprouts uh, or the, the new seedlings. But the fire will improve the quality of browse, the availability, and it'll increase our desirable form component as well. So all of those are desirable 
from the standpoint of uh, what uh, beer. I'll tell you what, uh, Courtney, if you could, just uh, poll the group to ask them if they know what plant species this is. I always like to quiz people on uh, plant identification, and as I said, and knowing your plants and knowing how to manipulate them is a very powerful one-two punch for uh, wildlife management. And uh, we're going to be able to get a poll up on that. I, this is a surprise to you, Courtney, so I kind of pulled one over here. I don't see that. Okay, here it is. If you know what that plant species is, uh, give me an idea. Deer would relish it at this stage, especially. You can appreciate that that's a very tender salad for a white-tailed deer right now. And again, I pulled one on you. No, uh, yeah, no, I'm not sure that uh, I got it submitted here just right. I'm going to have to resubmit that question okay. in just a second. Oh, let's not worry about it. I pulled a uh, surprise you on that one. Uh, that is skunk okay, bush sorry about that. that. No worries. That's skunk bush sumac. Again, all the sumacs are very vigorous reef sprouters. And again, that, that plant and its relatives will respond very well to prescribed burning. And again, uh, the deer would uh, love to get at that plant right there. Here's a collage of some other photos. This is shin oak. A shin oak respouts very vigorously. This is also shin oak. There's a lean, mean Dale Rollins circa 1982. I was doing a lot of walking for my dissertation back then. This is on the Wyo Ranch down in Kerr County. And just to show the impact of post-treatment browsing, in this case by deer and exotics, on the shin oak. So you can see in this exposure, the shin oak has made quite a rebound. But outside of that, how the deer and exotics uh, are attracted to that. So again, post-grazing management, post-burn grazing management has implications for our deer densities as well as our livestock densities as well. Such things as green briar, which might be pretty unpalatable in an unburned phase, and loat bush here are, uh, are quite palatable to deer immediately after a fire. So again, fire can increase the quantity and the quality of the browse. Let's talk about fire and quail briefly. And it's a kind of an it depends argument here. As we move east down where Stoddard worked down in southern Georgia, northern Florida, one of the keys to quail management in that part of the world is a vigorous prescribed burning. In fact, they recommend burning every other year. Every two years they burn to promote quail. Now out here on the western range of Bob Whites, I would never promote a two year fire frequency for quail. Because if I did, I'd burn up all my quail houses, my loafing cover. Uh, it's fire is much different out here where we get 18 inches of rain than where they get 55 inches of rain. So again, keep in mind those differences. Uh, but what fire can do for us, again, especially on sandy soils, we can really improve the diversity of many of our desirable native legumes, things like uh, the sensitive briars, uh, quail peas, some of those kind of things are all promoted as a result of prescribed burning. We get a flush of forbs following a fire that's a good seed producers and good producers for various types of bugs and other insects. And if you're managing quail, you got to be into managing for insects as well. But a caveat here is that, again, unlike in the deer situation, I've got to think, I've got to keep in mind that those bob whites and those blue quail need those quail houses, those Volkswagen Beetle-sized shrubs that they can get into during the uh, middle of the day and, and find protection from their various enemies. So uh, if I burn those up with a hot fire, it takes me 10 to 15 years to grow them back. So I want to heed the advice of the carpenter, measure twice and saw once. I want to keep that in mind as I'm doing fires. Another thing from a quail standpoint is I have to think about what is my cover situation now. If I have a hot fire, and my country looks like a moonscape, I've opened it up now to many of my enemies that are a real concern if you're a quail. So again, I've got to weigh the advantages and disadvantages of doing that. I probably don't want to burn in October when that landscape is going to be open during the fall migration of the raptors. So uh, some of the biology involved in that decision. We studied quail in the response to prescribed burning. Again, rarely do we lose the quail during the fire itself. They fly around the flame front, sometimes they fly through it. I've seen quail out there two hours after the fire's gone through, uh, sorting through the ashes and so forth. So in, in points further east, they call the uh, 
Bob White, a bird of fire, almost like the mythological bird, the phoenix. Out here on the west, again, we realize that fire can be a useful tool, but at, at a reduced frequency. So again, some of the things here that we want to keep in mind if we're uh, burning for quail. One is, we probably wouldn't want to burn 3,000 acres at a time, maybe 300 acres at a time. So again, the scale of that burn is an important consideration. One of the beautiful things, again, about uh, the fire is that we typically produce a diverse uh, array, a diverse plant community. Uh, generally speaking, the greater diversity of plants, the greater diversity of arthropods. And if you're managing for quail, or in this case turkey, again, that brood habitat, that availability of insects is really vital to you for those chicks and poults. And so we can uh, make some nice brood habitat as a result of scrub burden. Okay, let's have a review question. Fire during which season tends to promote forbs more than grasses? Give me your thoughts on that. And I bet Courtney's working to bring up the results, so we'll see what the audience said. Okay, uh, you're correct in saying that burning during the fall uh, will tend to promote forbs over grasses. Uh, the, I was trying to fool you about the soil type question there. That could have a little bit of impact, but again, the uh, burning during the fall, if you want to promote Things like fillery and broomweed and, and, and most forbs, uh, Engelman daisy, some of those kind of things, a burn during October will tend to promote those more than a burn in late March. Okay, let's move to our final part of today's webinar, and that's on what I've called here pyro management, just becoming a student of fire, and again, how to get started. Now, there's some really good, uh, good materials, reading information, so forth, available to you on the web. And I'll give you a website in a minute where it uh, serves as a good portal for those. But uh, some of the fine work done up at Texas Tech, Texas A&M, uh, each one of these uh, agencies or each one of these universities has put together something on getting started in prescribed learning. And I hope that you don't think that you're going to go out and burn. This is uh, mid-January. I hope that you don't think, well, I'm going to go out next week and do some burning. You really ought to be asking these questions a year in advance of when you're hoping to do a burn. Can you burn? Are you is your land situated in a, in a in an area? Are you in a fire friendly community or a fire unfriendly county? And believe me, there are are both. And we've seen quite an increase in the number of fire unfriendly counties uh, since the wildfires in Panhandle in 2006, and then the recent spate of wildfires last year. So there's the politics. You may or may not be able to burn. Uh, you got to be aware of that. Should you burn? Again, what what kind of objectives do you set for yourself? And will fire uh, be a good tool in your toolbox? Is it the only tool? Or could you do the same thing uh, with uh, brush management uh, in some other form? Where should you burn on your landscape? Uh, where can you burn? What types of, uh, of uh, soil types do you have? Uh, is erosion going to be a problem? Those are questions you ought to be thinking about. You know, these are questions you ought to jot down for yourself. And then if, if you're a student of, of uh, fire, ask someone that can help you work through those questions. How often should you burn? How much should you burn? There's a whole lot of different questions again, and you need to think about these well in advance. Are you a student of weather? If you're going to be a prescribed burner, if you're going to be a pyro manager, you've got to be well versed in weather. Uh, I have the National Weather Service's fire forecaster on my speed dial because when I'm burning, I want to check with them a week before the burn. I want to check with them the day before the burn. Often I want to check right before I start that backfire or head fire because what I'm seeing on the ground may not jive with what their forecast has been. And the National Weather Service, the, at least the fire forecasters here in the San Angel office, have been extremely uh, useful and knowledgeable, and, and they're people that you definitely want to have on your uh, uh, list of friends. But a lot of other things, again, about the uh, location, preparation of your fire breaks and those kind of things, just appreciate at this point in your career that prescribed burning is a lot more than just on match. And again, the types of uh, planning that you need to do pre-burn, during the burn, and post-burn are all very critical towards the success of your uh, 
of your prescribed burn. The training that you need, now there's both formal and informal training, and I'll touch on that in just a second. And then the coordination. Coordination before the burn, the day of the burn, and this does not only extend to the fire crew itself, but with your local law enforcement authorities, your county judge, all those kind of people. Again, it's a, there's a lot more to it than just throwing a match out there and hoping it doesn't jump your fire guard. Just appreciate the fact, again, that there's no substitute for experience. You can read a lot about prescribed burning, you can watch videos, you can do all that type of homework, but there's absolutely no substitute for being out there on a number of burns. Uh, you should set as a goal for yourself to be involved in at least 25 prescribed burns, I would say, before you ever think about trying to conduct one for yourself. So you can uh, work with your neighbors and uh, prescribed burn associations that I'll talk more about in just a second. Or there are at least one formal opportunity that I'm aware of for, for uh, prescribed burning. The Academy for, the Academy for Range Management uh, conducted at the Sonora Research Station uh, via Dr. Butch Taylor and uh, Ray Hennett, uh, formerly with Texas A&M. They do conduct some formal classes in how to become a prescribed burner. There are a number of great case studies that uh, probably some of these are in your neck of the woods, and I would encourage you to visit with them if you haven't and become conversant with the respective uh, agency people that run these. The Sonora Station there in, uh, in Sutton and Edwards County uh, has a great uh, history of fire, the Kerr Wildlife Management Area, the Chaparral Wildlife Management Area, and I'm sure there are some other WMAs perhaps closer to you, but these are some that we're all important to me as I, as I learned more about uh, prescribed burning. And then our uh, Quail Research Ranch up in Roby, uh, we've conducted about 65 prescribed burns up there over the last two years. So again, get to know these people, uh, volunteer your services, and, and, and get involved in some of their efforts. Again, there's been quite a uh, blossom, a bloom of prescribed burn associations over the last five years. And this is a really great uh, tool because when you need to burn, you need more than just you and your family. You probably need a minimum of eight to ten people helping you, and you need equipment uh, that you may not have at your disposal. So by working together in a cooperative kind of a situation, and these uh, two photos are from the uh, Edwards Plateau Prescribed Burn Association, which was one of the uh, leaders in this movement, and uh, getting together, learning about burning as a as a group, as a fire friendly. Uh, user group and uh, helping one another out. This is a fairly new tool, the Prescribed Fire Portal, uh, hosted by uh, Texas and m University, the Institute for Renewable Natural Resources. If you'll go to, let me see if I can get this website tapped again, pfire at tamu.edu, pfire, prescribed fire at tamu.edu. Uh, that's a wonderful portal for a lot of the types of information that you're going to want to uh, find the various uh, fact sheets and so forth. There's a really nice video that the uh, Natural Resource Conservation just produced recently talking about the fire. And so all those are available to you uh, in this online age that we live in. So uh, check those out. This uh, screen capture comes from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department's uh, website on prescribed burning and lists various prescribed burn associations in Texas. So if you're not a part of those, I would encourage you regionally to find out where the efforts are in your particular ecoregion and make contact with those individuals and uh, seek to become better educated relative to that. I want to end up with just a few of the ways that we use some of the new technologies in prescribed burning uh, at the Rolling Plains Square Research Ranch. We do everything on a polygon basis, and you can see that we just highlighted various polygons here. And some of these we want to burn, so uh, we use uh, Google Maps as a convenient tool, Google Earth, to create our maps. If you never use that, it's fairly user friendly. We use a word template to help us write up our burn plans. Every time we do a burn, if we're burning this polygon here, it has an individual burn plan. We don't want to start from scratch each time, so we've got a word template that we can uh, go in there and pretty quickly devise and, and uh, write down our. Uh, our burn plan. We use Garmin Rhino radios. These are two-way radios that have a GPS unit in them. And if I happen to be over here, but I want to know where the pumper's at, 
if I call the pumper unit, it comes up on my screen and I see exactly where the pumper is or where uh, the other drip torch is relative to my location. So that's kind of a neat technology. We use a handheld kestrel for measuring our relative humidity. Again, weather surveillance uh, during the fire itself, especially relative humidity, is a critical piece of information to you. And again, technology is available, which uh, basically makes that instantaneous for you. We use our cell phones again uh, for real-time forecasts with National Weather Service. If their model shows that we're supposed to have uh, winds at 10 miles an hour out of the southwest, but we've got winds coming out of the northwest at 18 to 20, that's a big deal. And so we communicate with those fire forecasters uh, to let them know uh, when their models worked and when they didn't to help uh, perfect that modeling in the future. If you've never tried a gas-powered leaf blower to put out uh, put out a fire on a backfire, that, that works uh, quite well. And we use Facebook to communicate our burn days. If we've got 15 people saying, oh, I'd love to help you sometimes, well, they're on our Facebook fan page. And if we say that we're uh, the weather conditions look good two days from now, and then we'll make a post of that before it says uh, conditions are still looking good. And so it allows us to keep from having to phone call everybody, and they can keep up with us via those social media. So that was a very fast and furious uh, effort at talking about the use of fire as a tool for managing wildlife habitats. I hope that uh, you're, uh, I hope that you're encouraged to consider fire as a tool, and I hope that you're encouraged to become a better student so that you will indeed be a good pyro manager and you won't be labeled as a pyromaniac. And with that, Courtney, I'd be glad to answer any questions if there are any. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rollins. We do have a question um, a couple slides back when you were showing uh, the map of the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch. Um, all of the burn areas were outlined in polygons, and some folks wanted to know if that was due to terrain, the, them being in polygon shape, or is it for another reason? Well, when that ranch was purchased, there were a bunch of roads put in there for quail hunting purposes. And so when I first saw the ranch and it had this uh, menagerie of pasture roads, I thought, ah, fire breaks. And so we just looked at that and have adapted all those pasture roads as the outlines for our fire breaks. And they're not in any uh, square or rectangular areas. They are literally uh, just dictated by the uh, presence of quail cover and so forth. So they're very much a hodgepodge of geometers. Okay, great. Are there any other questions at this time? Well, let's see, here's a question. It says, shouldn't everyone participating in a prescribed burn be wearing the correct personal protective equipment, such as helmet, shirt, pants, boots, vibram soles, gloves, blah, blah, and carry a burn shelter? Absolutely. Uh, practically speaking, in Texas, uh, not everybody does, but certainly uh, Monique, you, you're uh, right on. You know, personal safety is a big consideration, and the uh, the proper attire uh, is very important. Uh, obviously, anytime you're dealing with a um, government agency like the Forest Service and so forth, all their people do have the proper attire. I am not dismissing that. It is important. But there's a lot of prescribed burning that occurs at a lower degree of personal safety attire. Thank you very much. Um, our next question is, can you tell me a good source to learn more about shaded fuel breaks? I'm particularly interested in the utility of them to minimize losses of warbler habitat to, to wildfire. Well, I really can't, I'm not familiar with what you're calling shaded fuel breaks, uh, Mike. Uh, I would find somebody probably at uh, Fort Hood or elsewhere where they manage for warblers as a key uh, key species and uh, learn from them. I'm assuming what that means is, is again, just the uh, the fact that you have a taller overstory of shrubs and you have uh, minimum low, you have minimum uh, fine fuel loads, grass fuel loads in those shed areas and then backfiring off from that. That's a new term to me. Okay, and um, Clarence would like to know what percentage of your acres should be burned. Well, uh, Clarence at the uh, research ranch up at Roby and those patch burn experiments, we're trying to burn 10% of that pasture on an annual basis. Now, you can keep in mind that out of a, if, if you say, well, I'd like to burn 10% of my ranch per year, you're going to run into two, maybe four years during that 10-year period, which are not going to be great burn years. They're either going to be too wet 
or they're going to be too dry like last year was. So uh, a goal of maybe 10 to 15 percent per year might be a desirable goal, depending on what your management goals are. Okay, and we had another question come in that was, uh, how valuable is mowing when you can't burn for wildlife management? Well, I'm going to cite to you uh, something that one of my colleagues in Oklahoma State used to say, and uh, it's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek here. He used to say the only two reasons you run that brush hog, only two times you ever want to shred or run that brush hog, there's two reasons. One is when you want it to look good, or the other is when your wife is mad at you and you just need to get out of the house. Uh, shredding as a manipulation tool really doesn't, it doesn't provide any brush control, so it's really more of a cosmetic than a biological approach in most cases. Okay, our next question is how fast do native grasses respond after the burn? Okay, if you're interested in native, gra native grass regrowth, you get out there and you watch that let's say little blue stem, you wait till uh, say mid-March when that blue stem has about an inch of green growth on it, right down at the base. If you burn when that grass has an inch of green growth on it and you have soil moisture in place, within three weeks you're going to have a, a pretty incredible uh, plant response. So you want to you want to you want to postpone that burn until just before spring green up. If I was to burn right now, again, just soil temperature wise, my grasses aren't going to green up until uh, early April, say, just because of the soil temperature. Now you will see a greener a faster green up on burn country because that blackened soil surface is going to, the soil, the soil temperature is going to increase quicker than an unburned situation. So you will see a faster burn, faster green up, but still, I wouldn't wait, and, I mean, I wouldn't burn too early uh, if I'm interested in grass growth because the longer I leave that landscape bare, uh, the greater potential for erosion I have. Okay, great. And our next question is, uh, Dr. Rollins, do you uh, give us the name of a professional or someone who could help with a burn in the Milam County area? Is there anyone there that you'd specifically recommend reaching out to? Well, I don't know what the availability of certified prescribed burn managers is in that area. I would check with that uh, Prescribed Burn Association website. Uh, I check with the Texas Department of Agriculture. They have a uh, prescribed burn board. And I think they keep a list, a geographic list of uh, who is certified. There are some people I know of in that college station area, but I don't want to be giving preference to one over another. Okay. And can you speak to when is the best time to burn KR blue stem? Well, I guess my question would be, I'm assuming you want to say, do you want to control it? If you want to try to control KR blue stem with fire, you're, you're not going to do it. Uh, uh, KR blue stem, all of the exotic blue stems are very aggressive, fire tolerant species. If you're saying, how can I maximize grazing use of it, again, I would want to burn just uh, right at spring green up. So probably, depending on where you're located in the, in the state, sometime between early March and uh, early April. Okay, and our next question is, um, I hatched out and let loose 300 plus quail in the spring of 2010. Um, I've cut and piled cedar, but have lost almost all quail. Will burning the cedar piles help? No. Uh, in that case, uh, when you, there's just no way that you're going to insulate those uh, pin-reared quail. I mean, if that would work, our quail woes would be over. Uh, releasing pin-raised quail, just, they just won't survive. I don't care how you do it. Now, that has a related question there. A lot of people will say, well, I might have cleared too much brush. But I left the brush piles. That's a good thing for quail, right, Dr. Rollins? And I say, no, it's not a good thing. I don't like to see large brush piles on the landscape of quail because they tend to harbor skunks, raccoons, and snakes. And so you've got to think about, uh, you got to, if you want to favor quail, you've got to minimize your quail enemies. And so I don't recommend brush piles for that reason. Okay, our next question is, how effective is a prescribed burn for controlling Tassajillo cactus and bee brush? For Tassajillo, prescribed burning is quite effective. Uh, for bee brush, not very effective. Again, uh, the most fire intolerant species that we have in Texas would be the uh, junipers, especially the non-spouting junipers, and then uh, various species of uh, cacti. And Tassajillo is the most fire sensitive of the cacti that I'm aware of. So uh, we can take care of, if you've got fine fuel under it, you can take care of uh, Tassahia quite effectively with the prescribed burn. Bee brush, uh, again, you won't be happy with that. 
Okay, we have a follow-up question to the Kara Blue Stem. Uh, if fire is not the best to control it, what is? <laughs> I don't think anybody really knows right now. Again, the spread of uh, the various exotic uh, blue stems like uh, KR, Claybird blue stems, some of those, uh, has become a, a real issue for those of you in South Texas and uh, Central Texas as well. Uh, if anybody has a really good control technique, I'm not sure what that is. Okay, that's all the questions so far. Does anyone else have any more questions? I noticed, uh, Courtney, that uh, Dave Redden has, has again commented about the fact that uh, the, uh, the Fire Portal of A&M is the new website for the prescribed burn alliance in Texas. And so again, check that out. That ought to be your uh, first stop of online shopping as far as the various materials that we talked about today. Right. Thank you, Dave, for all your help in finding that website. And, and there is a link to it now um, up there for folks. If you want to, you can click on it, copy and paste it. All right. Well, Dr. Rollins, thank you so much for your help today. We really appreciate your presentation. Um, on behalf of the Texas uh, AgriLife Extension Service and the Texas Wildlife Association, we hope that you all will continue to participate in our Wildlife for Lunch webinar series. Our next uh, webinar will be Thursday, February 16th at noon, and we will have Dr. Hilly, Billy Higginbotham talking about feral hogs. So thanks to everyone. Um, as a reminder, you'll be getting a, a survey that will pop up in your window there um, as soon as you exit this. And if you'll give us your feedback and let us know if you have any issues or anything like that with this, um, we'd appreciate it. The next seminar is February 16th, um, and it will be feral hogs uh, with Billy Higginbotham presenting. And um, I'm posting the Texas Wildlife Association website um, up there in your link window again. If you uh, ever want to view the um, recorded versions of these seminars, you can go to the TWA website, and we'll have all past episodes recorded, um, so you can view it at any time. Um, again, this is Courtney Britton with the Texas Wildlife Association. If you have any questions or need anything else, feel free to reach out to me. And thank you so much for everyone, especially Dr. Rollins. Thank you today. Y'all have a great day. Thank you, Courtney.